Hello and Namaste. In our last session, the goddess appeared. Goddess Tripura Sundari herself. And she answered and resolved the questions of some of the sages. We left off at verse 70, chapter 20 of the Tripura Rahasya, in which we spoke about fearlessness. A state of utter fearlessness is attained when you are established in Atman. This is self-realization and is none other than fearlessness. Verse 70 says, One is completely free of freer and attains liberation. To be free from fear and the entire mind and its modifications along with shallow knowledge vanish and as I said the last time when the mind vanishes is not as if you do not exist anymore it is that you do not have a handle no one can touch you internally if somebody says something mean to you, it will not bother you because you do not have those samskaras. They have been burned in the fire of knowledge. So we continue. Verse 71. The seeker is not aware of his self-existent identity. Gurus and scriptures confirm this reality. There is no other way. As long as one is aware of the know, knowledge and the means through which it is attained, that is not the state of enlightenment. When the knower becomes aware of his self-existent reality, he is free from the delusion of real, duality. This is pure knowledge. From the beginning to the end, there is only one self-existent truth. Only for accomplishing worldly duties does there seem to be a diversity. In the beginning and the end, one is always one. Because of the veil of Maya, ignorance, one Atman is seen as the knower, the doer and the deed. Until the veil lifts, the whole world stands like a huge mountain of obstacles. When the sense of duality created by Maya is removed, then the cycle of birth and death vanishes like clouds dispersed by the wind. For attaining final self-realization, all resources should be applied. If all efforts are made with full compassion and a one-pointed mind, then one does not need any other means. If there is no self-determination, no matter if thousands of means are applied, it will be of no use. Therefore, self-determination is the prime means. No matter what happens, we have to accomplish it. This determination is the only way. Those who are endowed with this great quality attain freedom. Depending on his strength, purity and determination, the practitioner attains freedom in a few days, months or years, or in the next life. So to briefly summarize here, these verses are talking about self-realization. That we attain the state of fearlessness or self-realization we need to have determination. We are in living in ignorance or in Maya. What is this ignorance or Maya? It doesn't mean you're stupid. It simply means that you see the world differently through a filter of your samskaras. And this filter, also called Maya, 
makes us see things in a distorted way. We see diversity instead of seeing unity. We see many instead of seeing one. So we have a sense of separation. You see many people. You see people of different colors, different race, different gender. You see people of different nations or countries, people having classes. So you think in terms of poor and rich or educated and uneducated. All these distinctions are made due to your ignorance. This sense of duality is a state of ignorance. In the beginning, there was only one. And in the end, there will be one. It is only Maya which makes us see all this diversity. When this veil lifts, we see that one which is all. And that is the self or the divine, also known as God. <laughs> Until then, all the whole world, all these diversity, these distinctions, all this is like a huge mountain of obstacles. When the sense of duality is removed, then you attain liberation. And the only way to do that is one-pointed effort. Sense of determination. That sense, no matter what happens, I have to do it. And without that, it is not possible. Because you can use many means, but none of these means will help you as long as you do not have that determination. Verse 82 There are many impurities in the mind that disturb and defeat the seeker's efforts. Because of this, they are born again and again in this terrible world. The first impurity is, that, sorry, there are many impurities in the mind that disturb and seek, defeat the seeker's efforts. So what are these impurities which bring us back into this terrible world? If we use our strength and our determination, the Tripura Rahasya says we can attain this freedom within a few days. And if we don't have it, it may take many lifetimes. For a lot of people who hear this so a few days or months, that's ridiculous. I have been doing this for 30 years. I have been doing this for 40 years and I have still not attained. Well then, the possibilities are that your method is not correct. Another possibility is that you don't have that determination. Another possibility is, of course, that you carry a great deal of baggage from a previous lifetime which keeps dragging you down. Your mind is divided and scattered and you have not been able to resolve these conflicts and make your mind one-pointed. So, a great deal of ancient samskaras, vasanas, which are creating obstacle or badha, as it is known. So these are some of the possibilities which are blocking you from attaining speedily. So we talk about some of the impurities of the mind here. And the first impurity explained in verse 83 is the lack of faith. The second is the desire to gratify the senses. The third is inertia. In this way, in brief, there are three categories of impurities. There are two types of obstructions. One is doubt, the other is hallucination. The thought, is there anything like moksha, is a doubt and is a first obstruction. The second obstruction is not acknowledging bondage. Therefore, freedom is not needed. And both these are serious obstructions in sadhana. So these three verses, in these three verses, a lot has been said. 
for those of you who are on the path and are having the ambition of attaining self realization this is very important those of you who want to attain freedom from suffering these verses are very important verses 83 84 and 85 from the tripura rahasya chapter 20 faith a lack of faith too many desires and an inertia dullness a laziness these are impurities but there are two kinds of obstructions one is doubt and the other is not acknowledging the bondage so what kind of a doubt is there there is this one doubt which is the biggest block and that is this doubt actually is there something like moksha this is a very serious doubt you may doubt your teacher you may doubt the tradition you may even doubt a certain text and say maybe this is not the right scripture maybe the teacher is wrong maybe the tradition is wrong these doubts can be dealt with you can find solutions but if you even doubt moksha liberation self realization at the core such a doubt is at the core of the problem you cannot attain freedom if you doubt freedom imagine you are in prison and you doubt that there is a world outside you know you you don't believe that there's a world outside your prison if you've grown up in a prison in a deep dungeons where it's dark and dingy and you you were born there and you don't know anything about the outside world you only heard about it from maybe your mother who was in the prison and your parents who were in the prison and other fellow prisoners in this deep dark dungeon you only hear about the world of light above all these wonderful things there are things like trees and animals and beautiful people and wealth and comforts and luxuries and good food and here you are suffering in this miserable dungeon there in the dark you don't know about this wonderful world because you were born in this prison in this dungeon but if you don't believe this you don't believe any of these people and you just laugh at them and say ah you all have gone insane you all are mad this is the world here this dungeon is the world there is nothing else in that case you will never be freed from this dungeon from this prison you are stuck and this is the biggest doubt if you don't believe in freedom if you don't believe in liberation that there is such a thing as moksha it's the biggest obstruction and the second obstruction is that you need freedom if you're happy in that dark dungeon because you've made some friends there or your friends with the the prison warden and he gives you once in a while he tosses you an extra piece of dry bread then you think hmm i have a good life here in this prison because i'm getting food i have a place to stay and i have good friends here and if they would throw me out of this dungeon then i would be lost what shall i do so you begin to find your prison to be a good place to be you don't acknowledge the fact that you are in bondage you find it it's a good place this is a serious obstacle if you think that this experiences in the world are good and are all wonderful then there is nothing more beyond it because you also don't believe in freedom then there will be never any effort made there will be no determination to get out of it and so these are the most serious obstacles verse 86 with firm determination 
both of these obstacles can be removed. Complete freedom from them is obtained only when the cause of these obstructions is uprooted. There is no other way. Non-belief and contrary thinking to the sayings of the scriptures are the two main causes. If they are discarded and logic is applied according to the scriptures, then this twofold obstruction can be removed. After its removal, firm faith arises. By removing these two barriers, freedom is attained. Desire to enjoy worldly objects creates an obstacle to listening to the teacher because one whose mind is filled with desire cannot comprehend the truth. When the mind is preoccupied, it's like being blindfolded. Such a student is always preoccupied with the desired object. He does not see things placed in front of his eyes or hear words spoken into his ears. For one whose mind is filled with the enjoyment of the objects of the world, listening to the sayings of the scriptures is in vain. With the help of non-attachment, one can control such a mind. There are thousands of impure desires. Strongest among them is karma, the desire to enjoy. After destroying this desire, all impurities are removed. Therefore, with the help of non-attachment, one must eliminate his desire for sense gratification. The idea I should possess it should be eliminated. Desire remains predominant in the objects one can obtain and remains subtle in those which are difficult to obtain. In this way, all expectations can be shunned by practicing vairagya, non-attachment. So we see that these obstructions, being in a prison and thinking it's a wonderful place, not wanting to get out of there, not believing that there is anything outside, are the biggest obstructions. And when we are in this prison, in this dungeon, we begin to enjoy some of these things. We, we desire these things. So if the warden throws you a dry crumb of bread, you know nothing else. So you think that this is a wonderful thing, this dry crumb of bread. <clears throat> And the mind is preoccupied then with these kind of little desires. So our world is a little bit more complex than the dark dungeon that I used as an example. And so we find certain things very attractive. So we find beautiful cars. We want to buy new uh, smartphones. We find the latest iPhone is very, very exciting, very desirable to us. We want to get a house. We want to have the best house, better than the house of the neighbors or of your relatives because the desire is very strong over there because we have created it. We have strengthened these desires. It's preoccupied with these desires. And when the mind is preoccupied with such desires, you do not hear the truth. So even if you have a teacher or you're reading a scripture, like the Tripura Rahasya, you will not really hear it. You may be listening to some of this stuff, but it doesn't really register. It may be right in front of you, but you don't see it. Because the mind is full with enjoyment. And all these kind of little desires, there are thousands of these, they blind you. They blind you. And the only way is to remove these impurities, to remove these little desires. And you can only do that with vairagya or non-attachment. Remember the difference between tyaga and vairagya. Tyaga means actually giving up the object of desire. That means... Abstinence, celibacy, shunning the object. 
But vairagya doesn't mean you have to shun the object. You consume the object, but you know it is not yours. You have a sense of detachment. I like to use sometimes the example of a, a apartment or a flat, which you have rented. You live in the apartment, you rented this flat, but you don't get too attached to it, hopefully, <laughs> because you know that eventually you're going to move out, that you're going to get another place somewhere else, maybe your own place eventually. So you enjoy the place, but you use it. You use the rooms, you use the kitchen, you use everything, you make the most of that apartment, but you don't get attached to it because you know you have to move on. And that is something like Vairagya, where you use the objects, but without the sense of ownership. Verse, 30, uh, verse 95, the main cause of desire lies in brooding with the expectation of obtaining the desired objects. When non-attachment is practiced, such desires are destroyed. Inertia is the third impurity of the mind. O sages, it is not possible to remove it without the help of practice. Because of inertia, all potentials of the savakas are destroyed. To obtain freedom from that inherent inertia, devotion to the Absolute alone is the way. Through devotion and dedication, this inherent, inherent habit pattern can be modified. If those who suffer on account of this inertia apply all their resources in devotion to the Absolute, according to their ability, they receive the fruits either in this lifetime or the next. So we see that we went through the three impurities and um, we saw the first one was a lack of faith and the second was the desire. We talked about desire. There are many impurities, thousands of them. And the third is inertia. So the solution for desires is vairagya. The solution to get rid of inertia is also practice. Practice, devotion, these help us overcome our inertia. Inertia, the word in Sanskrit would be tamas. It's a heaviness, dullness. It keeps us stuck where we are. It doesn't let us move forward. Verse 100. All spiritual practices have only one goal. And that is to attain me. Who's me? Me is the goddess Tripura Sundari. One who with your heart and mind devotes himself to me, crosses all barriers and attains bliss. It is I who motivates intelligence. One who, ignoring me, treads the path of spirituality, stumbles at every step. It is not certain he will receive the fruits of sadhana. Therefore, O seers, the main requirement for sadhana is firm determination. The one who has that is a higher sadhaka. Among them, he who is endowed with devotion toward me is the most revered. Perfection means considering the body to be non-self and centering one's awareness in the self. This is called siddhi, perfection. People have not realized that pure self. That is why they are caught in the round of births and deaths and go to their destruction. Therefore, those practitioners who identify pure consciousness through which all objects are illuminated alone remove all impurities. Those purified ones remain absorbed in that realization. Powers such as traveling through space and of attaining anima siddhi are not really attainments. That which liberates the Aspirant is attainment in reality. 
All yogic powers are limited by time and space. Therefore, they are not even one-sixteenth part of the highest siddhi, self-realization. So what is the highest siddhi? Self-realization. This is the highest siddhi. So all spiritual practices have only one goal and that is to attain the highest. But those who practice without wanting to attain self-realization, they want to attain for other reasons. Maybe they want something. They have certain desires they want to fulfill. These are lower paths. So some people want, they practice or they pray or they do something because they are beggar, begging. They are beggars. They are begging for, yeah, they want to find a nice partner to get married. They want to have a son or a daughter. They want to have a job. <laughs> they want wealth. They want to be famous. Or they have certain other desires which they want to have fulfilled. And their focus remains only on these desires. They do not have the highest desire. And so those who practice with these in mind will stumble and they will not get or they may get. It's not certain. It's not clear. Because these are the lower desires. It's not the highest. So for that highest path, we need firm determination. And this is the higher sadhaka. He is very reverent. Yeah? We pay great respect to such a sadhak. He considers the body to be non-self and he centers his awareness on the self. And this is the siddhi or perfection. The others have not attained perfection and they are caught in their birth and deaths. This round this cycle, they keep on and on in this cycle. So those who are on the spiritual path but practicing for powers or siddhis. So as I said, you want something. Whether it's a car or a house, you want children, you want a partner, you want fame, you want wealth. All these are siddhis which you are craving for. But it's not the highest siddhi. These are called anima siddhi. And these are very small siddhis. And they are limited by time and space. But the highest siddhi, self-realization, atma jyan, sakshatkar, this is not limited by time and space. Verse 110. The pure knowledge of Atman cannot be divided. They are all segments of the knowledge of Atman. Those so-called Siddhis create obstacles on the path of self-realization. The true seeker does not gain or attain anything, just as no one attains anything from a magician's creation. One for whom even the desire for attaining the highest state has no value. For such a one, what good are these siddhis? Because they are mere pastimes. There is no siddhi superior to self-realization. By this siddhi alone, man transcend, transcends all sorrows and attains perennial bliss. Self-realization is the only siddhi which leads one beyond the sphere of time. There is no other way. According to the Vedic scriptures, the sadhana for purifying the mind and strengthening the knowledge of consciousness is of three categories. So before we go into the three categories, these last few verses have made it very clear that all the other siddhis 
other than the siddhi of self-realization. All the other siddhis are nothing other than obstacles. We have also referred to them as milestones. In Yoga Sutras we say they are milestones and it is a sign of progress. But if you get caught up in them, you will also find that there is another aspect and that is that it's an obstacle, it's an obstruction. It will prevent you from growing further because all desires have a quality of of growing. These desires, lower desires, can take over you. And you will fuel these desires and they become more and more. So it requires a great deal of awareness, very sharp mind. This is the razor's edge, remember. That if, if you start desiring various things and you keep running after these desires, you will be lost in the desires and you will lose focus of your higher goal. So the idea that these lower desires or siddhis are milestone can be misleading. This scripture tells us these are obstacles. And we tend to start chasing these. Some of you, those of you who know a little bit about Indian mythologies, you know about the stories where certain characters called Asuras would start praying for fulfilling desires of power. They wanted to to gain control over all the three worlds, lordship over the three worlds. And they used all their energies, their mind, into attaining these lower desires. And so, these were called demons. And you may think, hey, I'm not a demon. <laughs> I'm not an Asura. But if your mind is chasing lower desires, wants to have siddhis, powers, then that is exactly what you are. You do not have divine qualities, divya, sattvic qualities. You have tamasic qualities qualities of darkness. So, let go of these. Renounce these. And pursue the highest desire. All the other desires will be swallowed up, burnt up, when you set your aim a little bit higher and you cultivate the desire for self-realization. So there is no Siddhi superior to self-realization and it transcends all sorrows. You attain perennial bliss. And this is the only Siddhi, the one and only Siddhi which leads beyond time. All other Siddhis are within the sphere of time and space, which means you are in the duality. You are in the dual world. You are still stuck here. You are still in your prison. Maybe your prison is a little nicer now and the prison warden is maybe a little nicer to you and throws you a few more crumbs of bread, but you are still in a prison. Self-realization is the only way out of that prison, to freedom, to get out of that dark dungeon, go up, breathe fresh air, light, be among people, and enjoy that freedom and do what you like to do. That is only possible with self-realization. When you attain that, you are beyond time and you develop a very different perception. That is why such sages were also called seers. They see the world differently. They perceive things differently. That is known as darshan. Darshan is not going to a sage and bowing at his feet and say, Oh, I got your darshan and I'm happy. 
and I'm very honored. Darshan, the true meaning is that glimpse of the highest. That is what darshan is, the glimpse. To see directly that highest. So, coming back to the three categories. According to the Vedic scriptures, sadhana for purifying the mind and strengthening the knowledge of consciousness is of three categories. When one has firm faith and a sharpened intellect, has attained deep contemplation, such a one can recite the Shruti appropriately, though he remains in the midst of the worldly activity. So, living in the worldly activity, but you can recite the Shruti in the midst of the world. What is Shruti? Shruti and Smriti. These are two aspects. Smriti is that which is remembered, comes from memory. It's referring to book knowledge. You can read your book, you can remember all the scriptures, but it is not yours. You don't own it. You have taken ownership of it. You have usurped it by memorizing it and then quoting it every now and then in the midst of worldly activities. But you have not realized it of yourself. You have not had that glimpse. And the glimpse is Shruti. Shruti is a revelation. When it is revealed unto you, that is a revelation. You have seen it. It has revealed itself. The veil has fallen, even if it's only for a short bit. You have that glimpse, you had the darshan. And that is then a shruti. Because you don't need to remember it. That which you directly experience, you don't have to memorize. Right? If you come out of your prison, in that dungeon, and since you have made friends with the warden, the prison warden says, okay, I'll let you out of this dungeon for one day. Because a lot of you've heard about this, that there is this free world above, right? And I'm also telling you about it. It's true. But you don't believe me, so I'm going to let you out of this dungeon for one day. I'll take you up. And they take him up. They take you up and, and you see the world. It's only for a short while. And you see people walking. You see the streets. You see the cars. You see beautiful restaurants, people dining. Very fancy people dining in fancy restaurants, lovely cars, beautiful houses, very um, attractive gardens and um, fruit from trees. And it's, it's just like, it's wonderful compared to the prison you were in, which was a dark dungeon. And you ate some wonderful fruit. So sweet. You had never tasted anything like this. And then you had to go back. You were taken back to the dungeon. What happens? Your heart longs, longs to go back to that freedom. You keep telling everybody around you about this wonderful place that you were taken to by the warden. He took you out there. and But, it, but now you're stuck again here. Nobody believes you because they have not seen it. And they said, ah, these are just stories. You've gone mad. You've been in this dungeon now so long. You've gone mad. So, no one believes you. But, you, you don't need to memorize anything because you experience it directly. But one person you told all these tales to, he remembers everything. He didn't see the fruit. He doesn't know what the fruit tastes like. He didn't see the cars. He doesn't know what they are. He didn't see houses. He doesn't know what they are. He didn't see the roads and the gardens with flowers. He doesn't know what they are. He just has memorized everything. So this is Smriti. But the one who came out of his prison and saw the beautiful world with all its pleasures and charms, he comes back and narrates this. He reveals this and this is Shruti. So one who has too deep contemplation Attained with faith, sharp intellect means a sharp buddhi, deep contemplation. He has had a glimpse. This is Shruti. 
Then there is one. This is the second category. He remains aware of the self even in worldly activities. So this person, he, he has some amount of awareness. He has not come out of his prison. He has not seen that divine. But in the prison, he has a certain amount of awareness. He is in the Maya, he is in the world, but he has not come out of it. And the third category, the lowest category, is he remains engaged in Vedic studies, commits mistakes in pronunciations, and he belongs to the third category. So this is the lowest category. He's, he's committed, he's, he's, he's sincere, but he's only engaged in studying. So using the example of the dungeons, you came out, you saw the world, you went back, you narrated this wonderful Shruti to everybody. You have two students. One, he has memorized everything you said, learned it all by heart. And now he is starting to teach all this to other people. You have become the master and he's teaching the others, oh, what amazing things they were. The master saw all this and this is... These are the teachings of the master and you have to learn everything by heart and every day you keep repeating the same thing. Do you think that that, repeating that story is going to help you come out of the prison? I don't think so. And you don't either. You know it. But still, most of us are doing it. We keep reading the scriptures and we keep repeating, learning by heart saying the prayers again and again. In the dungeon, there's also another student of this master. That's you. You've become the master now since you got out of the den dungeons. And he's a little bit more self-aware. He's not experienced anything. He believes the master. He has faith. But he just practices a bit of self-awareness. He's aware of the walls of the prison, he's aware of the warden, and he's aware because the master told him that the warden is very important because the warden can take you out of the prison. Nobody else can. So this student of yours, he pays particular attention to the warden. So this is how we can understand the three categories of the mind or the sadhana. So verse 120 O seers, ultimately the science of the knowledge of Atman is threefold. That knowledge which makes one aware of the real self in all activities is called the first category. That which is maintained only when one is not engrossed in external activities is the second category. And that knowledge which remains only during meditation is the lowest category. When the knowledge of the self exists in the dream and other state, that is the highest. When the knowledge of Atman exists, even as previous samskaras take their toll, it is the highest. Then, without making any effort, the knowledge of self-realization is maintained, that is also the highest. When a man engages in worldly activities and sees the polarities of objects, yet internally remains above all. That means he has attained perfection. So we see that the highest category is when you can attain the state of full awareness, full self-awareness, whether you are engaged in worldly activities or not, whether you're dreaming or in deep sleep, 
whether you have some difficult situation you're suffering the previous samskaras are are active still and you have to go through the suffering such a one is called a jivan mukt the previous samskaras have still not um the power is still there the wheel is still turning and such a one is a jivan mukt and when such a one can engage even in worldly activities in waking dreaming state at all times effortlessly is the highest state one with such a siddhi is the highest of all seekers one whose samadhi is not disturbed even while functioning in the external world is higher than any other seeker one who has become aware of the level of realization of other seekers is higher than any other seeker because of his own self realization one who is completely free from doubts and desires is higher than any other seeker so we see that we aspire to this state and there there is a there is a bit of a pitfall here that many of us have started reading these books and scriptures like we are doing right now and so we hear this and we say oh um i have to be self aware all the time and all the activities i should not feel anything and so this is not self realization this is merely a spiritual persona a spiritual lifestyle pretending not to feel something pretending not to be affected pretending not to be disturbed is very different so we have what we call neo advaita so these are people who read books on advaita they follow advaita teachers and they they have a lot of intellectual discussions about this but they have no direct experience and at some point of time they start having delusions that they have attained the highest and they feel that they are higher than all other seekers so remember that this is a pitfall to attain that state of the highest you have to go through a very 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 difficult stage of purification you have to purify all these ancient samskaras just by reading a few books you are not going to attain that so such people they read their books and sometimes they become very arrogant because they create this delusion in themselves that they are higher than others and that they have attained the highest and they stop they stop practicing they stop their sadhana because they think they have already attained it this is very very dangerous this is um this is really the worst uh, situation you can be in in fact So verse hundred and thirty of chapter twenty. One who does not have even a single doubt or desire, and is fearless in functioning in the world, is considered by accomplished ones to be higher than any other seeker. One who seeks both the bound and liberated, and liberated individuals in his own self, and thus realizes himself to be Atman of all, is higher than any other seeker. one who sees both the ignorant and wise in himself that realized soul is higher than any other seeker one who renounces even the desire for self realization and sees both bondage and knowledge within is higher than any other seeker now renouncing even the desire of self realization comes really right at the end please do not give up the desire for self realization in the beginning this is uh, one of the last stages of sadhana verse 134 what to say i am that accomplished one this is the god is speaking i am that accomplished one there is no difference between him and me o seers 
I have resolved all your questions. If you contemplate on my teachings, you will be free from attachment. O son of Bhrigu, saying this, that divine mother went into deep silence. By listening to her, the doubts in the minds of all the seers were completely dispelled. And bowing in front of Shiva and other devas, the seers happily left for their abodes. I have given you the profound knowledge that dispels the darkness of ignorance. If you assimilate this knowledge and contemplate on it, surely it will lead you to the kingdom of divine bliss. This exquisite celestial song was sung by the Divine Mother for the benefit of the seers. Those who daily recite the songs of this scripture with firm faith make her happy. She imparts pure knowledge to them. To those drowning in the sea of delusion, this is a safe boat. To those who are in darkness, this is the light that dispels it. And that is the end of chapter 20. In our next session, we will continue. We are now the last two chapters, 21 and 22. We will continue next time with chapter 21. The means of attaining knowledge, the signs of attainment, the dialogue between Hema Angad and the Brahma Rakshas. So, until next time. It's nice having you here. Bye-bye, everyone.